Hi, everyone. We'll get started in a few minutes or even less than that. All right, we've got Ella joining us. Ella, let me know if you can hear me. And can folks hear me? If you can, someone can just jump. Perfect, thank you, Kendall, appreciate it. Just wait for Ella to join us. Thanks, everybody. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. So I'm from two computers. You can see the other one that you should unmute. I think it's under name Zach, which is weird. I was wondering why I was like, why is that say it looks it looks like Ella, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> cool. I unmuted Zach. So awesome. Are we so, good? Did we do it? Yeah, I think. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So I'm assuming everyone else can hear you too. Thanks so much, everyone, for participating with our technical difficulties. Ah, <laughs> oh, beautiful. There you are. Wonderful. Um, well, welcome everyone. I'll let people continue to stream on in while we get this party started. So thank you all so much for joining us for today's community webinar. Um, my name is Rachel Murray and I'm the co-CEO of She Geeks Out. And if you don't know who we are, we run empowering fun and educational events for tech and tech adjacent women, non-binary folks and their allies. And we provide corporate training on diversity, equity and inclusion. And today we are presenting a topic I am very excited about. What the F is data science? <laughs> with lovely Ella Alcalde Schreiber. And I want to make sure, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yeah, totally. Wonderful. And so before I kick it over to you, I would just love to give a little brief um, bio so people know who you are. Um, so as VP of Data Science at Hopper, which is an awesome company that everyone should check out. Ella is responsible for leading the company's data science team and building a data-driven culture within the organization. During her time at Hopper, Ella has tripled the data science team and spearheaded the company's AI and machine learning efforts, which drive over 20% of the company's sales. And prior to working at Hopper, Ella was a data science, a data, sorry, a data scientist at Outbrain, the largest content discovery platform in the world, where she, wow, uh, where she worked on recommendations, algorithms, serving over 500 million users every month. So no big deal. <laughs> Slightly impressive. So uh, let's get this party started for real now. Um, and share, I'd love to hear in your own words, you know, where you're from and, and a little bit more about your role in your own words. Totally. So thank you so much for the intro. And I'm more than excited to uh, have this webinar today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm leading the data science team at Hopper. I'm actually leading three different groups. Uh, the product analytics team, the data science team, and the research team. Uh, so all the analytics umbrella uh, under our flight business. And you're probably already wondering about my accent. So I'll tell you uh, that I'm originally Israeli. I moved to the U.S. three years ago with my husband from Israel. Uh, an extreme change to move from the Israeli startup scene to the crazy uh, U.S. industry. So very, very uh, exciting times. Uh, yeah, I actually, I prepared a quick slide deck in order to share a bit of what Hopper, what does Hopper do and what data science is at Hopper. I think that by giving some tangible 
applications, it will kind of like lead our discussion uh, with more depth and uh, industry examples. So I would love to share that. Yeah. Um, so I'll share my, so under Ella Alkali, I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. And I hope that now you can see it, right? Beautiful, yes. You can, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Present. Amazing. Cool. So I'm not, I'm actually unsure how many of you are familiar with Hopper. Uh, so I'll give a bit of a background, uh, more from the data science side. It all starts with what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, we've all been to this moment when we uh, plan our upcoming trip uh, and we're very excited and we search for flights and we see a specific price to the flight that we want to book and we're unsure. Is it a good price or should we wait for a better price in the future? And this feeling and this question is actually very, very valid because very frightening thing is happening with uh, airfare in the travel industry. This is a research that we've done. Those are real planes and I removed the uh, airlines for understandable reasons. But if we look at this, for example, this is a specific flight, specific airline, the same class. Uh, that leaves from Chicago to LaGuardia, New York. And this is the distribution of prices that, user, that travelers on that plane paid. So we can see that while there are some lucky travelers that paid uh, $200 for their ticket, there are some less lucky travelers that paid actually five times higher, again, for the same service, for the same flight, and paid $1,000. So what happened here? And by the way, this is sorted. It's on the right side of the plane, pays more than the left side of the plane. So just to <laughs> make that clear. Uh, but what is happening here? It's all about when you book your flight. Uh, there's price volatility, airline change your prices all the time, even on an hourly basis, based on uh, the demand that they see and different milestones that they have uh, around their capacity of their planes. And travelers, really, really afraid of that. So this is exactly where Hopper uh, started and entered the industry. What we do is tell you if you should book now or wait for a better price in the future. So we're mobile only uh, and user comes in and search for region, destination, departure, return, and can apply filters. And then we basically predict using data science, we predict the advanced curve of the future prices for the flight that you searched. And we tell you if the price that you see now is a good price and we think that you should buy, or we actually forecast a better price in the future. And we suggest you to wait for this better price. If you decide to wait, you can watch with us. We will continuously monitor the prices for you. And as soon as we hit the target price, the gold deal, deal price for the flight, we will tell you that this is a good time to buy uh, using push notification to your mobile device. Our prediction algorithms are accurate 95% of the time. And on average, we save our travelers $50 per ticket on domestic trips and $110 on international trips. So really materializing savings just based on empowering users with the data advice. Um, this conversation that we create with users and the trust that we build with users around when they should book created a dream uh, atmosphere for data science to operate in. So basically because we empower users, they are likely to search with us earlier and earlier and like basically search their trips and start to watch their trips earlier. Also because they wanna be informed by us when they should book their price or what we think uh, our flights that they will be intrigued by, they allow push notification, which unlocks a really amazing uh, communication channel uh, with the users for us. They also come much more frequently. They visit the app much more frequently because they monitor and check in how, what's their flight status. And for data science, this just unlocks this multi-session conversation and long-term relationship with users. Um, 
So when I try to think about how to explain what is the vision of data science at Hopper, it's literally what once was done by a human travel agent is now done by machine that gets smarter the more you interact or don't interact with our recommendations. So using AI, we basically empower travelers with their choices. Generally speaking, working in a company where data science is the value prop of the app uh, promises you that data science has a really huge role in the product development and also that we tackle super interesting challenges. So while we have plenty of different algorithms running in production now, I picked four, which I think that will be good examples for different aspects of where data science can come into the product and how data science can shape the consideration set of traveler or impact businesses. Cool, so the first one is our personalized flight list. Uh, this is driven by data science. Uh, there's actually a one person data scientist that runs this algorithm behind the scenes. And what we do here is personalizing the flight list that you see when the user searches to their willingness to pay. So let's say that I'm flying now to Israel. Uh, I'm going to visit home. And the cheapest flight costs $700, but takes 24 hours to get there. Am I willing to pay, let's say, $100 more in order to fly nonstop and get there by 12 hours? This is exactly the consideration set that we start to model. We're not doing sort by price. We are looking at the willingness to pay for a user extra over the cheapest price for some qualitative features of the flight. This algorithm really changed the behavior of our users in the app and removed a lot of friction in the booking funnel. It was actually uh, like it performed in reality better than we predicted. The ability to, to make it easier to get to the flight that you want and to find the most recommended flight for you made users much more likely to book on our app, which uh, materialized revenue to Hopper business because we're making money from uh, uses bookings. Totally different area, uh, using data to create uh, new inventory, new and unique inventory. Using an algorithm, like in-house insurance algorithm that we build that models risk and users upcoming intent for the trip that they search, we offer users uh, refundable fares. This is totally unique to Hopper and users love it. And in fact, 24% of our bookers actually buy it uh, in addition to their normal booking. So this is totally different product driven by data science again. Then we have a price hedging product where, which we call price freeze. Users are very afraid from volatility and price volatility. And sometimes we tell them this is a great time to buy. You actually see a great deal but they're not ready to book yet. They either need to consult with their friends or family or like check something out there uh, before they book their trip. So right now we're making sure that they won't miss the good deal that they saw by allowing them to hold the price that they see today for a nominal cost using our short-term predictive technology. And that way we're making sure that, use, that we extend the booking window for the users. So they're not missing out on a good deal, but they can make sure that they actually want this trip. Later for like, they can use the nominal cost that they put in order to hold the price towards their booking. So then it's kind of like a short, short uh, term wallet. They basically can use this money and they're not losing any money with us. On average, the user saves like $77 uh, on those frozen flights. So that's clearly a huge win for our procrastinators. <laughs> <laughs> and the last but not least, alternative recommendations. Basically understanding the user upcoming intent and flexibility and the extent of flexibility and suggest users with alternative trips. So alternative origin, destination, departure, return in order to materialize savings or suggest them trip that we think that they might be intrigued by that they even didn't even think about. Uh, we do that by understanding better, by understand, by looking at users that are similar to those users and see what they like. And based on that, suggest to, this, to that user, think that we think 
things that we think that they might be interested in. Uh, this is a very successful algorithm. In fact, users that are exposed to this are 40% more likely to buy trips that they never even search for. Um, so here comes that trusted advisor uh, that knows even before you know what you want to book and what you might, uh, where you might fly next. Um, yeah, so those are just four out of many others. Uh, we also have the all hotels uh, product where we do a lot of personalization around hotels for you and sorting and ranking there as well. Our notification brain is a huge topic. Uh, the price prediction is constantly evolving. So very heavy data science product. Wow. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Ella. Like it, it's actually, I mean, I just want to make this very clear. Like without you and your team, there is no hopper. Like, <laughs> say that with every company and it's it's really cool to have you talk about it because I think obviously data science is more and more relevant to more and more people more companies but it's just so core to what you do so thank you for sharing that and making it sort of real and tangible um, I have a bunch of questions definitely encourage um, people to use the chat to ask some questions but I would just like to kick us off by this is just a question that I have and, and I should say that you know I have some familiarity with tech. I'm a front end. My background is in front end web development, but I, I'm kind of an older school person and I feel like <laughs> it's more of a newer thing. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between data science, data engineering, and data analytics? I hear that thrown around so much. I'm like, ah. Uh. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So I think that first of all, it starts with data creators and data consumers, data producers and data consumers. A data engineer is a data producer, while data analysts and data scientists are data consumers. They are consuming the data that the data engineer uh, built for them. So data engineers are basically software engineers that, speci that specify and build it in building data warehouse, data pipelines to store the data effectively and to be able to access the data effectively. Then there are the data uh, consumers. So data scientists and data analysts will use the data the data engineer uh, stored for them in order to do either modeling or run analysis. So that's the first uh, differentiation. Then between data analyst and data scientist is more fine line and I feel like in different companies, it's slightly different things. But generally speaking, a data analyst will conduct ad hoc analysis on potential impact or actual impact of different product features on our customers. They basically will help us to understand better how our, like, how our customers are impacted by different things that we develop or how we think that they will be impacted by different things that we plan to develop. Um, while data scientists are running models. So they will be this layer between the user and the data that empowers user with the data advice. So they will run the um, price prediction algorithm, the uh, risk modeling for insurance. They are basically modeling um, different, different conversations between the user and the data. Got it. That was really, really helpful. Ah, someone wrote in, data scientist here. What does the productionalizing process look like at Hopper? Do the data scientists own and manage data engineering and the SDLC process, or do they lean heavily on the technology team? Asking because it's messy where I work and I end up wearing different hats depending on the day. It's messy everywhere. And <laughs> uh, it's really hard. So we kind of like evolved um, with, at the beginning, we were a more scrappy startup and data scientist was a full stack data scientist. It means that basically data science was responsible for the model data, as well as the modeling, as well as the uh, analysis, the evaluation, building the, back, the frameworks, running the services, everything. Um, so right now we revert to a more standardized framework. So today we have a machine learning framework that is being uh, managed by data engineers and infra team. And 
data science can use this framework in order to deploy, optimize, and control data science algorithms in production. But the data itself is managed by the data engineering team, and the model itself is managed by the data scientist. So the engineer team has full control over the framework and the stability of the system, right? We don't want to break the app. But the data scientists enjoy full stability, uh, full uh, accessibility, and um, flexibility around the models that they run. Did that help? I well, we'll find out. I'm sure that will <laughs> tell us. Um, that I have to tell you was like over my head. So I don't know how many other people are data scientists on. <laughs> webinar, but that was great. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to know a little bit about how you got into this role. Can you talk about that? Totally. So I was always interested in the intersection between people and science. I really love solving real life problems, but I really, really love math and computer science and chaotic systems. So data science was a natural fit for me that combines using science in order to really like real life problems. And I always say that when I meet this user, uh, when I meet this user out there that tells me, oh, you work at Hopper, you guys saved me like $200. It's, it's almost surreal to me that behind those numbers, there are real people that get impacted by what we do. And we actually like help them travel and travel more and save more. So yeah, it's, it's the perfect job for me. <laughs> what, how do you, like, what, did you, do you need like I'm assuming you need quite a lot of advanced degrees. Are there, what's the, what's the level of education that's required for any? Yeah, so I always say that I, the one thing that I think that is the most important for becoming a good data scientist is the statistical foundation. I think that while tools and language, like programming languages, change all the time and also become easier and easier to use. Uh, to have a good statistical foundation is super helpful for first to understand which models you should use given the specific problem that you try to solve, as well as translating the actual like model results into actionable uh, insights and action items for the other teams. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right on. And then we got another uh question. Uh, what is the key software you use to conduct your data analysis? I'm guessing, and this person is guessing, not me. Uh, what do the data scientists use uh, for their analysis creating slash creating models? So for models, we use Python. Uh, yeah. Our sense. All our app is written in Scala, but data science algorithms are running in Python. Because they run as services, it doesn't matter. Like They should not uh, be exactly what the backend is written by. Yeah. Love it. And I just love that, like, I'm asking these, like, kind of really super <laughs> questions, and then we're getting, like, sort of nerdy questions. And I <laughs> No, those are great. This one's great, too. We've got another one. Are you seeing any interesting trends in the industry? And this is one of my questions for later on. How AI will continue to evolve data science? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a fascinating question. I think that we already see the data science is spreading to all industry, right? The travel industry, even agriculture, um, if it's pharma companies, drug development, data science is everywhere and companies really see the value in AI and the power of AI. Uh, I think that it kind of like comes back to the point I made earlier, while tools and programming languages become easier and easier and almost like everyone can, uh, can apply state of the art uh, algorithms and machine learning on problems using Python and our packages. I believe that the entry barriers for industries with AI will be the data itself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what Hopper was facing in the early years. We it took us four years to collect enough data to be able to do what we do today. Mm -hmm. uh, there are industries where data is more out there and there are industries that the data collection becomes the real challenge because the computation is there and the talent is there, but the data that you should be working on um, is less available. That is so interesting. Um, thank you. And I'm going to go back to another basic question for for those of the people who are on the on the webinar that are sort of curious about it and want to see about getting into it. Um, I'm curious, 
what is it like to like literally day to day? Are you just like in front of a computer? And I know that you're, you're a VP, so you're not, you're probably doing more HR than like, <laughs> but like if you were a data scientist and you were getting into it, what does it actually look like? Yes, I would say that there's no really typical day also for ICs, for individual contributors. It really depends on the company, on the team that you work in, and on even the, the stage of, the, of your project. I mean, data science project usually start with the business di driven aspect. It starts with what is the problem we try to solve? What is the question that we try to answer? Why does it matter? Uh, what success looks like. This is a very, very hard part. Usually this part is a lot of collaboration with the t stakeholders, understanding the company grows levers vision. Then there's the, then there's the data, uh, data cleaning where, and data manipulation, where basically there's this very famous saying that I'm sure that everyone here heard of, garbage in, garbage out. We don't want to jump into modeling before you're sure that the data that you build your model on is reliable and trusted. So there's a lot of data cleaning and then you move into the modeling stage where you basically start to understand how you're going to tackle those problems given the data um, and what approach you want to take. Then you evaluate your model and then you deploy um, to production or reevaluate uh, and redo the process if the evaluation phase didn't go that well or if you want to introduce challenger models. So I think that it really, really depends. It also depends what kind of problems you're solving. But overall, it's a combination. I do think the data becomes more and more core to companies, which suggests the data becomes more of a collaboration. Uh, within companies. So there's no just sitting in, in like in front of your computer and do your thing. It's also a lot of uh, communication with the stakeholders, with your teammates around what you're trying to do and what results looks like. Yeah, it's interesting because Hopper, because this work is so core to H Hopper, I'm curious, like, what is it like to be a product manager, like, and a data scientist? Like, are there just <laughs> they are best friends. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, yeah, data science at Hopper is not a service org, is a product org. And we basically have data science products in the app. So there's a really amazing collaboration between our product uh, managers and our data scientists and our UX designers. I'll tell you a funny story about Hopper that I think demonstrates the best how much communication is key when you build a model or solve a problem. So when Hopper originally worked on the price prediction algorithm, we launched a price prediction algorithm to the app and we called it forecast because we're forecasting the future prices. Users thought that we talk about the weather. They did not understand that it's prices because <laughs> we use the word forecast. So it's so, so, so important that you understand how your consumer base understands you and you, you make sure that the product managers and the designers and the engineering teams, like everyone understands what you're actually doing so you can communicate effectively to them and to your customers. Yeah. Wow. That's hilarious. And I can yeah. know that can happen. Uh, <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what a career path might look like? So, like, and I don't know if that ever happens where people are, you know, product managers and they want to get into data science or if they're in college and they want to do something. And there's actually more and more boot camps that are out there that are trying to solve the issue of, because I know that there's just more and more of a need for people to do this work. What does that look like for from entry into sort of like your level, for example? Yeah, so I think that for entry, what you need is, uh, communication skills, super extremely strong analytical ability, and problem solving skills. Uh, I think, I mean, analytical ability, you need to be data savvy, you're going to work with data, you're going to live and breathe data, you should be comfortable with data, you should be passionate about data, you should understand data. So that's clear. Uh, communication is what I mentioned before. You work with a team, especially in B2C companies, especially when data science becomes core, you want to communicate effectively your ideas and your results to a non-technical technical audience. Problem solving skills is that the more you grow within the data science field and the, the more senior you get, the more unstructured the problems become. And then you can't solve everything. You need to uh, sequence wisely and understand what are the important pieces, what do you want to work on first and 
uh, yeah, and basically, so that's the, the entry barrier, I think. Those who have that, uh, at Hopper, we have two growth trajectories, basically two career paths. The first is principal, and the second is lead. Uh, principal will be someone who's a senior uh, individual contributor, who's a world-class data scientist, who's a point person for uh, more junior team members, and they don't want to lead. They want to continue to to do their amazing modeling work. Uh, lead is someone who's data scientist that starts to also uh, mentor people and have a team. So at some point at Hopper, after someone is with us uh, enough, usually there's this conversation like, what career paths do you think of? And based on that, we, we build them to it. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. I love those paths for people who want to just stay an individual contributor also, because not everybody wants to be a people manager. Yeah. And I mean, there are, I mean, we didn't invent the wheel. There are so many companies where it's like that Facebook, Amazon, Google, everyone figured out that they are like super senior talent. Some of them are more interested in principles. Some of them are more interested in leadership positions and you may need to make sure that you have like paths to success for uh, both scenarios. Well, it's smart that you were paying attention to what other companies were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what the future of data science is? Um, and I think that's really interesting. I'm curious too, it's like, what's the future for Hopper? So Hopper is a marketplace and we try to move to serve the full, uh, the full trip. So we try to expand beyond just flights to hotels and car rentals and transportation experiences and basically when user comes in, there's this one place, they hop it, they find what they want, and uh, we help them to find the right package uh, of travel for them. So that's where Hopper is aiming for. Okay, I see. Vague answer. I like it. I <laughs> is it vague? <laughs> I just like, mentioned the roadmap. What are the new products? I want specific. I guess oh, what are the new products? So we work a lot. So in... Yeah, so basically we have a hotel business that moved from being R&D to more established uh, products. So today everyone can find this uh, Hopper Hotels. We also launched rental cars this uh, quarter and we're moving towards uh, more price hedging products. So similar to what I showed with price freeze when you hold the future, the the price for a, for a few days, but also why wouldn't I just sell you the future price today if I know what uh, what the future price is like and I know that you want to buy. So there are a lot of different initiatives around that. Um, a lot of insurance products around um, refundable fares and um, like, um, yeah, like health insurance and things like that. I love that. I think that's very interesting. I was I was actually very upset because I was in a store recently and I saw the thing that I bought was on sale for I hate when that happens. So if Hopper wants to get into retail uh, clothing, let me know. Um, I have one more question. People feel free to ask any more questions that you have. Um, just, I'm really curious about the, the, um, the airplane that you showed and why the right side was so much more expensive than the left side. Do you oh that? yeah, no, that I, we just sorted the prices so that the right oh. side was more expensive than the left side. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was sorted. I'm never going to buy a right side plane ticket ever. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Yeah. No, 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 no. So it's, yeah, we just sorted it. So it's clear, it's a clear, like, uh, view of the prices but yeah no it's not the right side of the plane pays more so. like what is that hat why is that okay that's <laughs> those are my only questions i don't know if you have anything else to add or if anybody else has any other questions but if not we're happy to have our other half hour uh left over for lunch <laughs> uh yeah are there any questions from people all the questions have been answered everybody knows i'm curious to know how many people are in data science even on this um on this webinar maybe people are shy or maybe they're already eating lunch i think there's someone asking are you getting data largely through web scrapping or do users also help with data collection so that's a great question uh hopper does two things we we get searches from all across the web so hopper collects billions of price itineraries from 
all across the web. It means when you search on Expedia or on Kayak, uh, we get the results that you see. Uh, we work with GDSs. What is happening in the travel industry is that when you search for a flight, there's a third party company that the, um, the travel agent or the website uh, queries and get the results from. What we do is we work with this company and we buy all the results that they provide. So I don't know it was Expedia, I don't know it was the user, but I know that this was the search and I see all the flight list prices. So if you think about flight list, it's the origin, destination, departure, return, for classes, uh, flight numbers, and all those. In addition, so that was the data science that Hopper was built on. And this is what I mentioned when I said that we purchase data, that's the data that we actually um, still acquire until today. And we have six years of historical data and up to 50 trillion price itineraries up to date. So it's really, really dream database. And, and this is the first database. So now when we have a really huge user base, we have over 41 million users. We also have internal data. So we also have our user behavioral data. We track everything that the user does on the app. So if the user search for something, if the user tap on something, if the user saw something, if the, we send the user something, everything is being tracked. And for me, this is a much more interesting database. So if the combination of the huge market database with the user behavioral data is what allow us to do things like the algorithm that I shared before that does the personalized flight list for example. And this is a really, really powerful tool that also unlocked our relationships with airlines. So today we collaborate with our airlines friends on innovation in the travel industry. So for example, Lufthansa Group uh, invested in Hopper $6 million to, to collaborate with the data science team on this behavioral um, like economic and understanding better the future of the travel industry. That is yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Have, really, I love this question. Um, this person's not a data scientist, doesn't have a strong background in quantitative science. Um, what's your opinion of boot camp programs? Do you have experience with working with boot camp graduates? Yeah, I think that there are um, so many amazing uh, platforms out there to learn data science. Uh, if it's Coursera, if it's EDX, if it's boot camps, learn Python, learn SQL, learn statistics, understand how to tackle problem, and you can find your way to every company. Um, I think that as an entry, it's really, really good to find internship programs within companies. Hopper has interns and 100% of our interns uh, became uh, full-time employees with us. Uh, there are like all the big companies have internship programs that are really, really well organized. Usually when you're doing your internship, you tackle small, small problems, you gain confidence and expand your toolkit you are exposed to the thinking process of the organization and it really sets you up to success. I love that. I love that you mentioned also like, cause boot camps can be really cost prohibitive. And so it's nice that you mentioned about Coursera and edX that are, that offer free. Yeah. Well, have you ever had anybody be an intern that didn't come from a particular institution that was just like, Hey, I learned all this stuff and I'm applying for an internship. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for having a really diverse team. So there's nothing I like more than having people from totally different backgrounds collaborating together in one team. I feel that it pays off in ways that you would not expect and it brings a really interesting conversation to the data science uh, table. Um, so yeah, totally. I agree with that 100%. Um, <laughs> uh, great question. Um, product designer here, how might data science influence product roadmaps uh, and UX design in a product that's less data driven. How my data science influence product roadmap? Yeah, so at Hopper, in addition to 
guiding our users and helping travelers with this data advice, we also build data-driven culture internally. Um, everything we do at Hopper is measured. And every time we have an idea, we tie it back to the business gross levers. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one thing that we have at Hopper is that when user is about to book in the booking process, the user has to sign up. Uh, basically, it's a huge friction point. There's a huge drop off in the funnel when we force users to sign up in order to complete the purchase. So using analytics, we are explaining better uh, what is this friction point by how much the UX can be better if we remove to, let's say, guest checkout. And based on that, we drive this uh, project moving forward. We also A-B test everything, also design. So every time we have a new design or we think about like different value proposition for a product or different ways to communicate a specific idea, we just A-B test it. So we have the ability to randomize our user base partition and deploy. So each, you, so there are gr different groups of users that see totally different treatments. And then we see how that impacts the different matrix that we try to improve. So let's say conversion, retention, um, engagement. And based on that, we empower our uh, designers with, with which design is most effective. Awesome. And um, so I think this is similar to the pr uh, previous question around um, if you're in another industry or have a different title, how do you break through this person's in higher ed in a marketing role. Does a lot of marketing data analysis, but thinking of moving to for-profit. Marketing data analysis is such a good uh, entry step for uh, product analysis and data science. Because if you understand marketing, you basically understand customers and you understand data and you make data-driven decisions, right? Because you basically look at your marketing targets and you run campaigns probably, and you optimize your campaigns based on data. It's very, very similar internally. Uh, we collaborate, Hopper has a marketing group and we collaborate with them very closely. They are super data-driven by their nature. And a lot of, many times we see that the insights that they have are similar to the insights that we have internally. So for example, if a specific, um, scoring function that suggests specific deals externally to acquire users is, all, is also the winning variant, the winning uh, algorithm that um, converts more intern users that we already acquired on the deals that we show them and things like that. So marketing is very equivalent. If you're in marketing, I would just like try it out. I mean, Renata, it sounds like you should apply for a job at Hopper. I'm just saying. Totally. We have many openings. I don't know if I mentioned that. So <laughs> many openings. <laughs> data analysts, data scientists, uh, researchers. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, let me know if you hire her. You know, we want to <laughs> uh, So coming from a company that is less data-driven, do you have any suggestions to promote and grow a data-driven culture? I think that the best way to do it is to prove that it works and that it drives better decisions. I think that Hopper for a long time was very design focused. And by the nature of the startup, we had less data exposed. So we had less opportunity to make data driven decisions. But the magical thing with data is that it's less an opinion and more like numbers. The data tells you things. And as soon as you start to listen to the, to look at the data, to extract actionable insights, and it's super important that it's actionable insights and not just an interesting stuff, <laughs> um, and act on it, and then demonstrate that it drives results to the business, everyone starts to adapt to it. Uh, I think that another super important thing to democratize data uh, in an org and make more data-driven culture is to make sure that everyone has access to data and that you use a good self-serve platform that unlocks the ability to look at data to also like beyond the data science team or the data analytics team. And when everyone has access to data and everyone starts to speak data, it's naturally happening. Um, I must say that it's also on the leadership 
if the leadership is very data driven and promotes that, usually the company will be very data driven. Like having business people that are data driven is key for a data driven company. So it does make a lot of sense. So. Yeah. I will say just as a side note about the design, the design of Hopper is like the best. <laughs> I'll definitely pass that to them. They work very hard on that. Uh, yeah. We all, we all at Shigigs out love the Hopper stickers and everything. So, <laughs> um, so uh, someone else asks, uh, Rebecca asks, what tools would you recommend to someone who is not a data scientist but wants to improve data analysis efforts within a small department? Sure. So the tools that, that Hopper uses are Tableau for BI, for business reporting. Uh, we use a platform called Amplitude, which is a self-serve tool for user behavioral analytics. Um, super easy, non-technical visualization as well, but I mean, there is infrastructure to build it. Uh, more advanced, we use uh, Python. So we use all the like Matplotlib and visualization packages there. Nice, and I think that actually answers the other question that was right after that. And then there's another one. So uh, data rights, when you set up an A-B test around how long does this take from planning to providing insights? Um, they're in an industry where they have to move quickly and don't have luxury of time. In the end, data is not tagged properly and then the analysis can fall short. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, that's, a, that's close to my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopper moves very, very fast <laughs> uh, as well. And we really value speed and uh, quick iterations. At Hopper, the, when we talk about, so I'll explain a bit how product development works at Hopper because this, this will explain what is happening. Uh, we basically have lanes, it's kind of like a squad where we have a PM, a UX designer, data analyst, data scientist, six engineers and engineer lead working as one group, autonomous group, under a specific mission. Mission, mission can be uh, expand internationally. Mission can be remove the friction from booking. Mission can be insurance products. Mission can be price hedging. Um, so those kind of missions. When we come up with a new idea, based on where the feature, the product, the visualization, whatever it is, is in the app, the group conversation is around how long would it take to learn? How long would it take to learn really depends on liquidity, on how many users, customers, observations eventually you'll get every day. Uh, there are equations that tell you how many observations you need in order to get to statistical significance. So when we know on which screen we're gonna be and we know what, imp what improvement we want to make we know and we know how many observations we have on the screen given a day we can put it in the equation and tell how how many days it will take us to get to statistical significance yeah so it's in the planning of the the product we know how long the learning will take ah the planning perfect <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um does anyone else have any other questions one more what was your career path before coming to hopper that outbrain thing is outbrain's weird by the way we talked to think a little bit about it when when we first met i'm like outbrain is creep um talk more about the relationship between gathering data to improve systems so my career path is an interesting story <laughs> so as i mentioned i was originally uh living in israel and i after at school, went to the military. I was in a, in a squadron of helicopters uh, at the Air Force in a mission control coordinating uh, different flights. And after that, I joined the aerospace industries where I worked on developing new aircrafts. So before you fly in a plane, <laughs> uh, there's an R&D process around developing this plane. And I was in squadron that basically developed new aircrafts for all the brands that you're familiar with. And basically monitored and coordinated all the training, the testing, um, 
the uh, requirements, the development, the engineering, like all the different teams that collaborate together um, around building new planes. Then after that, I took uh, a year off and I was backpacking for a year from South, um, from the southest place in America, Ushuaia, Argentina, all the way up crossing 11 countries to um, Cuba and Mexico. During this time, somehow in all this freedom uh, of Southern uh, Central America, I realized that I would go to, uh, to do engineering degree. So I came back, started like, basically pursue engineering degree and then started my data science career. It's funny because since then, I mean, I worked in uh, data science companies. I, uh, as Rachel mentioned, I worked at Our Brain, which was an amazing place to work and serving so many users. I mean, half billion users a month. I was there on the recommendation group. So I worked on building recommendation algorithms to our users, basically for those who are less familiar with Our Brain, when you visit a different website, there are more uh, recommendations for you of different articles that you might be interested in. So if you think about the, the data science problem is you have a real estate of a widget with eight placements and you have a bunch of different content that you can offer the user and you need to understand in real time, given a user, diff given the different content, which eight recommendations will be the most interesting for the user. Um, if you think about very similar to what I do at Hopper today, uh, I always love recommender systems and B2C companies. So Hopper was a natural fit for me. And then I joined Hopper. At Hopper, I started as uh, IC, individual contributor. I was the 38th person at Hopper three years ago. Today, we're almost 350 people. Um, we were three data scientists. Today, we're 20. <laughs> and then at Hopper, I just, I started to to drive more and more initiatives, to implement more and uh, more and more algorithms, to break the app, <laughs> to revive the app. And then I started to lead uh, part of the analytics. Then I started to lead more parts. And today I'm leading the, the three groups, the research analytics and data science of the air side. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because this mission control sounds very like far and different, but I always say that today I'm back in my mission control. So many things are moving, so many different uh, inputs, people, teams. So it's it's kind of like my new mission control here. I love it. And yeah. the, 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 the second part of the question about the relationship between gathering data to improve systems while maintaining user privacy, which is hard. That's a really good question. And it becomes a really important topic these days when things start to get creepy. At Hopper, we really, I mean, of course, uh, we really care about user privacy. I don't know that the user, I don't know the user's name or I don't have any identifiers for the identity of the user. What I have is a randomized user ID. It's like a string of numbers and, uh, and letters. And I know that it's the same string over and over again when the user, when I see the user um, in different times, but I don't know any, anything about the user. And we have a whole, like we have a dedicated team for that, uh, that take, takes care of privacy and data privacy. That's yeah. Great. It's also part of data engineering, going back to the first question. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then just final question, perhaps. Oh, nope, not final. But yes, Kendall, uh, this will be made available um, to everyone afterwards. We're recording it. Um, and Dana asks, is GDRP CCPA affecting some of your data capture? It's a great question. Yeah, so we are following the, the rules and uh, basically, yeah. Like, as I said, we have a whole legal team that is making sure that we're not. They have to yeah. check the box that they... Um, the only thing... Yeah, I mean, most of our user base today is in North America. Um, so yeah, we're, until now we weren't that huge in Europe. We definitely want to go to expand internationally and then we have to take those things into account. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. And when, when uh, Felicia wrote, was our lovely co-founder. Uh, I, I literally just went to Hopper during this talk to input info on an upcoming trip. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> awesome, that's great. Uh, let me know if you saved. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I Thank want to hear the stories. Yeah, yeah, and as I mentioned, 
Hopper is hiring um, as basically we fundraised $100 million a few months ago. And since then we increased sales by over 100%. So it's really exciting time to join. I'm hiring data analysts, data scientists, and team leads. So more than excited to get people reaching out uh, and always happy to help people when I enter the field with whatever I can and give my advices. Thank you so much, Ella. That was great. And yeah, I definitely encourage people to, uh, to apply because everything we know of Hopper is delightful. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rachel. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your week and weekend. Bye. Thank you.